I'd like to invite your attention back to the book of Colossians in chapter 3. Um, we come to the close of this powerful book today. And I hope as we've gone through it, uh, you get a glimpse of why it is my favorite New Testament book. Because we are reminded at every turn who we are in Christ, what our identity in Christ means for us. You know, we try to find identity in so many different things. We identify ourselves by our heritage, and by our genetics. We identify ourselves by our family, or maybe by our sports team, or, what, or our jobs, or even by our children, or whatever the case may be. But for us as followers of Jesus Christ, the most important identity we have is our identity in Christ. Who we are in Christ. And I just want to remind you at the very beginning in chapter 1, the theme verse that we looked at, that it is Christ who is in us that gives us any hope and assures us of our hope for glory. It's not our heritage. It's not our DNA. It's not our history. It's not our family. It's not our job. The only hope, the only security that we find, the only assurance we find it's because of who we are in Jesus. And we've been called to live in his kingdom and to live in his church. Now let me just kind of say some things before we dig into this last part that I think will help us make some sense of why Paul is ending this letter like he does so many different letters with names. It's kind of like he gives a roster of so many people. It's easy for us when we're reading through the Bible, just for one thing, those names are hard to read and they're hard to pronounce. When I uh, texted Jimmy this week and I asked him if he would read the scripture and he agreed to, I said, thank you. I said, because you're about the smartest person I know and can pronounce all those New Testament names, you know, those multi-syllable names that are there. Uh, they're hard to pronounce. They're hard to say. And so it's easy for us when we realize oh, he's just talking now, he's just talking about people. This isn't, this isn't doctrine, this is just him signing off and saying so long. But there's a lot that can be learned from this. And just kind of the 30,000 foot drone view of it all, I want us to be reminded of this, that because of our identity in Christ, and you see this in the main point, the Christian life is to be lived in community. It's to be lived together as we support and help each other all along the way. There's no such thing as living Christian life in solo. As a matter of fact, the New Testament word that is translated church is a Greek word, ekklesia. And it means to be called out from one group into a smaller group. Those of you that are mathematically minded. This is so simple, but it's going to probe the depths of my knowledge of math. It is like the idea of sets and subsets. The set is all the people in the world, everybody who lives. But the subset is that God has called his followers into a subset to be together. We're not individual factors in the larger set. We are together a subset. And so the Christian life is meant to be lived together. We are by nature a gathered community. We are gathered together for our mutual accountability and encouragement and strengthening and discipleship. And just as one log removed from a fire will both diminish the heat from the fire itself and will also ensure that that log will eventually burn, uh, stop burning and grow cold, when we remove ourselves from the body of Christ, the body of Christ suffers, and we assure that eventually our spiritual fervor and heat will eventually fade as well. We're meant to live together. And one other introductory statement I want to say and then explain, and it's one of those I want to be one of those statements that kind of stick with you from this. You don't have to go to church to become a Christian. But you do have to go to church 
to be a Christian. Now let me take a moment and explain that. You become a Christian by placing your faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross, in his death and his resurrection, in believing that Jesus is the Son of God, the payment for your sin, and that he is now Lord of all, and you, you surrender to him as Lord of all, and you are invited into, and you, you make a, a choice then to live in his kingdom, and you surrender to his kingdom. That is what it means to become a Christian. But if we're going to be a Christian, if we're going to live the life that he has redeemed us to live, an essential part of that is that we will live it with other believers. Nowhere in the New Testament do you see believers commissioned to go off and to be hermits and to live by themselves. But they are told to gather. In fact, the book of Hebrews tells us that we are not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. There is, there is a great sense in which in order to become a Christian, you don't need a church. But if you're going to be a Christian, if you're going to live the Christian life, if you're going to be obedient to the one that you have declared is Lord, then you're going to be part of a fellowship that is his. And so Paul is addressing a fellowship. He is addressing as we saw at the beginning, saints who are in the church at Colossae. That's how he addressed them. Saints and faithful brothers gathered in Colossae. So what do we learn from this? And what I want to see as he closes out this letter is I want us to understand that one of the reasons we come together is that there are four church relationships that every Christian needs. Four relationships within the body of Christ that every believer needs. And what I want to challenge you, and this is what we're going to get to when we, when we land the plane, this is where we're going to taxi to the terminal on this thought. Am I being these four relationships to others? And who are these four relationships in my life? All right, so let's we got all the preliminary work laid. We've plowed it up. We've laid out the rows. Now, let, rows, now let's plant the seed and get to, get to going here. Four relationships within the church every believer needs. First of all, every believer needs an encourager. Look back with me in the scripture at verse 7 here in chapter 4. Tychicus will tell you all about my activities. He is a beloved brother and faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. And with him Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you. They will tell you of everything that has taken place. Now let's think about Tychicus. What a name. Tychicus. It's one of my favorite New Testament names. I think just because it's just a neat sounding name. But not only is it a neat sounding name, Tychicus was a very interesting person. Now you don't have to look at all these passages, but I'll just kind of give you a little bit of background on Tychicus. We, we first find Tychicus in Acts chapter 20 and verse number 5 when he is one of a pair of traveling companions of Paul as Paul is going to Troas. And, and we, we learn from this that Tychicus, along with his companion, are, are probably from the northern part of Asia Minor, which would now be the northern part of Turkey, which is, by the way, where Tanner and Caroline Brooks are serving as missionaries. So they are kind of a Tychicus in that area. That's where we first read of him. He's a traveling companion of Paul. We also find in Ephesians chapter 6 very similar words as Paul is also not just sending Tychicus to, Col to Colossae, but also to Ephesus. Chances are both of these letters were written while Paul was in prison, and he 
uh, rolled them up in a scroll, and he gave them to Tychicus and asked him to deliver them to several of these churches. He sent him also to Ephesus and used very much the same terminology that he would let them know what all was going on with Paul and that he would encourage them. And then in Titus, as Paul writes to Titus, he promises Titus that he would, uh, that, that, that he along with another, there were two possibilities that, uh, and Tychicus being one of them, that Paul would be sending to Crete to relieve Titus of his pastoral duties because Titus had done a good job. He had done all that Paul had called him to do and now it was time to turn it over from a church planter to a permanent pastor and Tychicus was one of two who were in contention for that, but in the chronology of Paul's letters, we realize he didn't send Tychicus because in 2 Timothy chapter 4, we see that Tychicus was sent to Ephesus to relieve Timothy and allow Timothy to come back and to be with Paul. So Tychicus was the kind of person that Paul could trust, but what was it he did? He was an encourager. What were the things that he did? It said that he, he sent them for this very purpose, that he may encourage your hearts. We need people around us who will encourage our hearts. And there were two ways that Tychicus was an encourager. He was a passive encourager, but he was also an active encourager. Now, how was he a passive encourager? He was a passive encourager by the things that he did. Look what, look how Paul described him uh, as he described him in verse 7. He is three things. He is a beloved brother. He is a faithful minister. And he is a fellow servant in the Lord. A beloved brother. He's a brother. He's a follower of Jesus, and not just a follower of Jesus. He has, an, he has endeared himself to many people. People loved Tychicus. He was one of their favorite people because of his walk with the Lord. It wasn't necessarily uh, specifically <coughs> because of things that he had done for them. It was just something about the way he lived his Christian life that made him a beloved brother. But we see that he was also a faithful minister faithful. Day in and day out, you could count on him. He showed up when it was time to show up, and, and he would be there to, to minister, to, to serve. And this word here for minister is where we get the word servant. It's also where we get our church word deacon, but it's used in so many different contexts in the New Testament, but always in the context of being one who would do the kind of work that nobody else wanted to do. He was willing to roll up his sleeves. He didn't care about getting notoriety. He didn't care about getting pointed out from the platform and people knowing who he was. He was just faithful to do the work. And he was a fellow servant. The word here for servant speaks of a slave that is a completely, totally indentured slave. He had given up all of his rights. He had given up everything that he owned and everything that was his, and he was totally committed to the cause. That was the way he lived his life. And there was just something about watching Tychicus be Tychicus that made other people want to walk with Jesus. And we need people like that around us, that when we, we watch the way they serve the Lord, that, that we really don't see them, we see Jesus. And we are challenged and we are encouraged that, you know, I, I wish I could be that way. I wish I could serve God that way. I, I wish I had that kind of devotion. I wish I, I loved Jesus like she loved Jesus or, or like he loved Jesus. He was, he was known for his relationship and his work. Notice he was known for his work for Jesus. He was not known for his own stuff. He was not known for building his own reputation. He was, he was known for what he did. For Jesus. But there was also some very active things, and these were the things he said. He said that I will tell them, or he will tell you what is going on when, uh, with us. In the verse 9, they will tell you of everything that has taken place here. And at the end of verse 8, he may encourage your hearts that you may know how we are. He had a way of saying things that just made people feel 
better. You know, honestly, it's a challenge to me when I think about this. This is, this is something I pray about. Lord, use my words to build up, not to tear down. Think about that for just a moment. Are we the kind of people, and do we have the kind of people around us that their words encourage us? And are we the kind of person that in the things we say, we encourage? I want to challenge you. Every day, find somebody to speak a word of encouragement into their life. Something positive to say. Too many times, most of our words are gossip. Most of our words are what's wrong with people. Or, or most of our words are critical. Or most of our words are what we don't like. We, we share our opinion about things that are, are wrong and we wish they were that way. And there's just so much heaviness and pulling down with our words. But Tychicus was the kind of person that when it came out of his mouth, it was like a sweet song that lifted their spirit and encouraged them and made people smile. Because it was a positive word. In Ephesians chapter 4, Paul told the Ephesians that, that they were to be careful that no corrupting talk would come out of their mouth. And we always think of that being just dirty words. Don't say dirty words. But corrupting is an adjective that doesn't necessarily speak to the kind of word that it is, but the effect that the word has. It is not a corrupt word, it is a corrupting word. It is not a word that is rotten, it is a word that makes whoever hears it rotten. Do our words lift up? Do our words encourage? Are our words positive? In Christ, we have the opportunity to help people grow closer to Jesus, both by the words that we say and by the example that we set. Everybody needs an encourager. You need an encourager. I need an encourager. Second of all, everybody needs a partner. In verse 10, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you, and Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, concerning whom you've received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. And Jesus, who is called Justice. They are the only men of the circumcision, that means they were Jewish, among my fellow workers in the kingdom of God. Now we're going to come back to that phrase in a moment, but pay close attention to that. My fellow workers in the kingdom of God. And they have been a comfort to me. They were a comfort to me. He says that they were fellow workers. Let's talk about Mark just a minute. Who in the world are we talking about Mark? We first encounter Mark in the New Testament in the Garden of Gethsemane, although we may not realize at the time that that's who it is. We find out later in the book of Acts that's who it was. But in the, if you remember the Garden of Gethsemane when the Roman soldiers came to seized Jesus and the disciples got scared and they ran. The one of them was a young man that they grabbed his robe and he was so frightened or they grabbed his cloak, he ran right out of his clothes and he streaked all the way home. It scared him that bad. He'd just soon run home with no clothes on than to go back and get and run, risk his life by going back to get what he had left behind. That was Mark. We find him later in the book of Acts when there's a prayer meeting at his house when Peter was in jail and they'd been praying for Peter's release and God answered their prayer and Peter showed up at the door and a young girl named Rhoda came to the door and saw that it was Peter and went and interrupted the prayer meeting and said, y'all, Peter's at the door. And they were like, shh, be quiet. We're praying for Peter to be released. They didn't even believe in their own prayers were going to be answered. We find him there. We find him later in the book of Acts when he is on a missionary team with Paul and Barnabas as they are commissioned from Antioch of Syria to go throughout Asia Minor and to plant churches. And along the way, he decides it's a little bit too hard and 
he goes back home to Jerusalem and leaves them. A couple of chapters later, when they decide to go back around and check on the churches that they had started, Barnabas wanted to see if maybe they could take John Mark with them. Let's get him back and get him back. Paul really, they, the Bible says they had a sharp disagreement about it. So much so that Paul went with Silas and Barnabas went with Mark and they doubled the ministry. And now all of a sudden we find Paul again speaking highly of Mark. In fact, also in 2 Timothy, he, he asked Timothy, send Mark to me because he is, I love this phrase, he is useful to me in the ministry. Now think about that change. If I can't trust him, if he's going to run off and leave when it gets hard, he's not useful. Now all of a sudden, Paul realizes, no, Mark's grown up. Mark's grown stronger. Mark has proven himself. He's useful now to me. This is the Mark that he says is a fellow worker. And being a fellow worker has encouraged his heart. Now this word fellow worker comes from a Greek word where we get a, an English word that we use a lot these days and it's the word synergy. And it means to work with. Now I've included in your notes a, a dictionary definition of synergy and I think it kind of describes the biblical concept of working together quite well. It is the interaction of elements that when combined produce a total effect that is greater than the sum of the individual elements, contributions, etc. Um, I believe it was Aristotle that has been misquoted as having said that the sum is greater, or the, the, the result is greater than the sum of the parts. and didn't exactly say it that way, but that's kind of over the years how it has been restated. You may be more familiar with that phrase that the result is greater than the sum of its parts. That's what happens when we work together, but it implies two things. Being a fellow worker, first of all, implies intentionality, but it also implies effort. It's work, but it's specific work. It's work for the kingdom. They weren't just doing stuff together. They weren't just going out to eat. They weren't just buddies. They, they, were, they were doing God's work together, not their work together. They were doing God's work together. They were partners in the kingdom of God. And we're going to see in this passage a lot of focus on, on the kingdom work. And I want us to understand this. We are most fulfilled when we are working together with others to accomplish kingdom work in the name of Jesus. Not our work, not our agenda, not our plans. But we are seeking what is the kingdom work, and together we are pulling together and working together. We are synergizing our intentional effort. And that's the kind of person Mark was. He was a fellow worker. He didn't work against Paul. He didn't say, well, Paul, that's a pretty good idea, but I think we ought to do it this way. He didn't, say, well, Paul, he, he didn't say, Paul, you do you and I'll do me. He didn't say that. It wasn't you and me, it was us. How are we going to serve the kingdom of God together? We need partners in kingdom work. Not just friends, not just buddies, not just people to go out to eat with. We need people that we are assured that we are doing God's work, what God has called us to do, and that we are doing it together. Think about what did Jesus do with his disciples? After he had trained them for a short while, he sent 70 of them out in groups of two fellow workers. He always assumed they would be working together because there's so much more to do than we can accomplish individually. We need partners. The third relationship in the church we need. We need an intercessor. In verse 12, Paul says, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, greets you, always struggling on your behalf in his prayers that you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. We also find Epaphras mentioned with his larger name, Epaphroditus, in Scripture. 
He was probably the founder of the church at Colossae. He had heard Paul preach, and he had become a follower of Jesus and a disciple of Jesus, and one of the first things he did was he went back to Colossae, and he began to tell about Jesus and begin to win people to faith in Jesus. And so he's telling the Colossians, one of your own, the one who kind of got it started for you. Notice what he says to them. He had come to check on Paul, and Paul said, he is always struggling on your behalf in his prayers. Struggling in prayer. How often do we struggle in prayer? If we're honest about it, we don't struggle with it. In fact, chances are, prayer is kind of like the weather. Everybody talks a lot about it, but does nothing about it. We talk a lot about prayer, and often our prayer is just reciting some words that we have memorized, and we say, well, we've prayed. And we just pray in generalities. God, forgive my many sins, bless all these people, be with us, we, all these general prayers. But how many times are our hearts literally torn as we pray for somebody? Now, notice what he's not praying. He's not praying that their financial need will be met. He's not praying that they'll get out of the hospital. He's not praying that their neighbors will start acting right. He is praying. What does he, what does he say about their prayer? He's struggling that you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. That's a mouthful. He was praying for his fellow believers to be mature and to be assured that they are doing what God wants them to do. He was praying for them spiritually. I want to challenge you to move your prayers to another level altogether. To get past the praying just for the physical needs. Are you praying for somebody's spiritual development? Are you praying that they would grow in their understanding of God's Word? Are you praying that they would grow in, in their knowledge of God and, and that they would walk in the will of God, that they would know what it is that God wants for them each day? I firmly believe in praying Scripture, and I would, I would strongly suggest using that phrase right there when you pray for others. Pray that whoever you're praying for would stand fully mature. And that they would be fully assured of what God wants from their life for that day. What a great sentence to pray. Those two things. It's as simple as that. Praying that God would do that. He was praying for spiritual growth. So I challenge you to pray purposefully, regularly, and fervently for each other. Pray for our spiritual health. So we need encouragers. We need partners. We need an intercessor, but we also need a practitioner. In verse 14, probably the most famous name on the list. You know this guy because he wrote a book, one of the books of the Bible. Luke, the beloved physician, greets you, as does Demas. Now, what do we know about Luke? Well, here, he is a beloved physician. What we see is that Luke possessed a resource that benefited other people. He was a physician. He was a doctor. He had a special skill. There was something that Luke could do that other people couldn't do and that a lot of people needed from time to time. He was a specialist, so to speak. As I said, a practitioner. And he was beloved because he served others. Now let me tell you, there are certain things that you do, very practical things that you can do, that most of us can't do. You have abilities, you have possessions, or you have knowledge about things that, 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 that benefit others. And part of being in the body of Christ is who you are and who God has made you and what God has placed in your hands. He's placed it in your hands so that you can use that to serve others and to build others up. Special ways that you can help others that other people 
can. And can I just say that a lot of times this probably needs to be done rather quietly. You don't toot your horn. I don't think Luke would have been a beloved physician if he'd have constantly gone around the church talking about all the people he had doctored. That was even before HIPAA laws <laughs> and regulations. I imagine he just quietly went about his business, helped people, receiving nothing in return, just the joy of knowing God had used him in a special way to bless another believer. What is it that you have? What is it that you know? What is it that you can do that can be a blessing to other people? How can you use it? How can you be a practitioner? So I want you to think about these four relationships. The encourager. Using words to build up. So take a moment. Who is encouraging you? Who do you have that on a regular basis maybe is your best cheerleader? It's telling you that everything's going to be okay. God definitely is, but we need each other. Who in the body of Christ encourages you? But let's flip that over. Who are you encouraging? And who are you, maybe unintentionally, maybe not, discouraging. How can you use your words to build up? So I want you to think of, as I said earlier, one person that you can encourage, to be an encourager to them. And I want you to think of that person who is an encourager to you, and I want you to be thankful for them, and to maybe even thank them for being an encourager to you. Let them know that. Uh, they might encourage you even more if you let them know it's working. Because one of the hardest parts about being an encourager is not knowing if it's working or not. Partner. Who's your partner? Who are you doing kingdom work with? Again, not who's your buddy, who's your friend. Who are you standing shoulder to shoulder with in spiritual battle? Who is it that you've seen God has brought you together to accomplish his purpose in your life? Who is that? And who are you partnering with? Who is it that you're standing shoulder to shoulder with and being a, you know, using synergy, working together so that the sum of your efforts is just totally shadowed by the result of what God accomplishes from the two of you working together. It may be more than two. It may be three or four. Who is your intercessor? I'm thankful uh, that I have about five very close friends that I can contact at any time, share any need, and they will pray. And I feel like they all have the red phone on their desk that's attached to heaven, that when they pick it up, God's on the other end. And I trust them to pray not just for my need, they pray for my spiritual need. They do so on a regular basis, and I know that. I know some of you that pray for me, and you have mentioned that you do that, and I cannot express to you the magnitude of my gratitude for that. That you would, instead of talking about me to others, talk about me to God. Talk about me to others, they can't do anything about it. Talk to me about God, He can straighten me out. I know you're beginning to wonder, but He can and will eventually. Who are your intercessors? Who's praying for your spiritual growth? Who's praying that you will walk in obedience to God? And who are you praying for those things? And then practitioners. Who has helped you in some specific way with something that you could not have done otherwise? Used a special skill or some special knowledge that they had to 
to help you serve God in a better way. Or maybe shared in a possession that they had. You know, Barnabas was one of those. You remember where Barnabas shows up first in Scripture? is early in the book of Acts, where he sells some property and brings the money and lays it at the apostles' feet. He didn't tithe it. He 100 percented it. Gave it all to be an encouragement. He didn't have to do that, but that was something he had that he could do. I'm not saying that we should all do that. But there's something about you that is unique, and your uniqueness can be used to help others. Who are you helping? Who are you benefiting? This is why we're together. This is why we've been called together as a body of Christ. We are encouragers. We are intercessors. We are partners. We are practitioners. Together, we serve the kingdom of God. And it is all based on what Paul said. It is not our identity in ourself. It is our identity in Christ. We do it because we are His. And we do it because of what He has done for us, what He is doing in us, and what He has promised will be for us in the future. And because we are all in with Him, sold out, lock, stock, and barrel to Him, because we are His, then we are each other's. So you want true fellowship? Fellowship is more than a bunch of 9 by 13 casserole dishes with fattening food. Fellowship is more than just having parties and enjoying each other's company. Fellowship is more than just getting together and laughing together. Fellowship is sharing life. It's riding the roller coaster together. It's encouraging. It's partnering. It's pleading to God. It's practicing what God has given us. May God make our church a church that reflects His glory, His presence in each one of us.